The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. In my opinion, the gospel is under assault right now. This UFO topic, believe it or not, this entire UFO phenomenon, did you know it fights Christ only? It doesn't really fight anything else. It, it just fights Christ. It is very seductive. It's capturing the minds and the souls of a lot of people. And in every single case, when people get very intimate with this subject, they believe most of the rhetoric and stories. Did you guys know in Roswell, for example, in Roswell 1947, that not only are there mistakes and some pretty wild things in the claims of Roswell, but that, did you know at the, the exact same time, you guys know about Project Paperclip and Project uh, Starlight and all these different projects they had back then. Did you know that the USA was manufacturing enriched materials through light? Not by any other process, but through light, which means they, what would normally take about six years to do, they could do it in a couple days' time. They actually achieved this. And of course, they didn't want the world to know about it. Anybody can go and dig up some of the archives and read about it now in hindsight. But all those Nazi scientists, Project uh, Paperclip, you guys remember that, and where it got its name from, they would take the file. If they came across a Nazi, they'd put a paperclip on the file. And that meant to scrub this person's background to give them full entrance into the USA. And they were right there in Roswell and outside of Roswell. You guys know that, right? So back during that time, there was some pretty wild things going on. It's also where there were some rituals that took place. Now, you guys know the Nazis. They were These guys were knee deep or let's say neck deep in esoteric rituals. So they did that there. And when that crash happened, the Nazis were always involved in recovery, archaeological digs and finds and things of that nature. And so essentially they somehow, with an incantation, bought things into that area. They, it's almost like they bought a curse into that area for the sake of advancement. But they did not want to show the absolutes of it. Because I'll tell you right now, the crash, that was real. That was a real crash. But there's another sign to that crash that uh, not too many people know about it. because i'll tell you right now what's questionable is were there real entities in that crash there were there were real bodies found there but and, and they were not dummies these were biological bodies but uh, what were those bodies from bodies of what now at that same time you may not know this but they used to use prisoners that meant height weight and uh, certain disease requirements to put them in some of these uh, test craft to see where the effects of the human body were. They used to do that. Of course, back then, nobody back then would have agreed to that. Roswell was also one of the biggest stockpiles of nuclear weapons just about anywhere. Nobody knew that fact either. Did you guys know that fact? So you're talking about a mixture of something very ancient that in fact did happen there, but also something very seductive. And they utilize, now this is the kicker, this UFO topic is full of real things, but they utilize that as a cover-up for something that they've been doing for a long time, right? What better way to cover up and misdirect through something that is, for the most part, a true story, true, true things, but the origin of the craft, the nature of the craft and everything else, normally people speculate on that. They have all, all that speculation, but those craft are real. In fact, if you knew about those craft, you wouldn't want to see one ever again in your life because they're nothing like what you think they'd be like. Do they have metal? Yes. Do they have, uh, you know, but, but these craft also have biological tissue in them. You wouldn't want to see that. Who would want to see that? That's what was happening a long time ago in this world. Can you imagine something part metal? part biological which is why they're finding so many fossils in the ocean so many hardened structures that look just like ships everybody every, if they made one popular but hundreds have been found petrified ships how does a ship petrify right how does that happen well that's because they contain biological material and when i say biological material i mean biological material working organs and things like that inside those craft so they were doing things back in the west time they were doing things in a very uh in a bad way. You wouldn't want to see that right now. Can you imagine a biological life form that cannot cry out? It can only be used. That's it. But it can't do anything else. Could, could you imagine that? So they, they knew biology so well that they were actually utilizing biological systems to further whatever they needed, which was just gross. You're talking about a mixture of all types of different 
animals and species and growing them in certain ways, removing DNA, adding DNA, doing this, that, and the other. That's what you're talking about. So not a good thing, right? Even the detail, well, somebody says, uh, are missing cow parts being used? You know, they, in all these cows, most of these cows, not all, but they take hormones. If you look at the parts of the cow that have been extracted during these mutilations, not all of them, but some of them. If you look at some of the quadrants of sections that have been taken from these mutilations, some of these holes that people find, you'll find that those holes lead right to parts of the cow that produce hormones. That's what you'll find every single time, right? So there you are. When they, when hormones, that's a key to changing known biological structures. If you were to introduce hormones into a human body, the human body is going to change. It doesn't matter how old you are. You start taking hormones from animals or something like that, you're going to start changing. Things are going to start changing within your body. And again, on many of these mutilate, mutilation cases, you can see pieces of flesh being removed to access parts of the cow that produce hormones. You'll see it a lot. Now, some of it is human. Some of it is misdirection. But when you see the vast majority and they have access to uh, soft tissue to extract whatever's producing hormones, you really can't make that mistake when you do your own research. I wouldn't suggest anybody go deep into that because it's uh, it's not a tasteful subject. And I believe that at the root of it. It is uh, it's extremely seductive. It's fighting Christ. In every single case with these people that are abducted, did you know that in most cases when people are abducted, they always come back saying the same thing. They always come back. They have a message. And the message is that Jesus was just like anybody else. Now, they don't attack any other religion. They do attack Christ. They do speak about Christ every single time. And you'll hear that from people who believe and what they're being told or whatever's in them after being abducted. They do the same thing every time. They talk against Christ, trying to make him a normal person. So something in this world is trying to defeat the power of Christ. Now, as a consequence of that, you also see correlations. Since the time of this UFO stuff, this topic, you've seen almost a, a, a direct assault upon Christianity. You've also seen the blessings of the living God be absent in a lot of people's homes. It's almost like protection has been lifted from a lot of people. Why? Because they're opting to believe the message from the wrong messenger. And you can't force a person to accept Christ. You're going to ultimately accept what you truly identify with on a spiritual level. These things are identifying with people that uh, are likely from the same seed they are. It seems like hardly anyone is concerned about someone's innocence. They're concerned about how someone is guilty, how they can see blood today out of somebody else, how they can ruin a career. And this entire world is quickly becoming based in that type of mindset. It really in America, more so than any other place in the world, we get a chance through the internet to examine other nations. And I, I think that all of you could agree that Americans are bloodthirsty for some reason. God doesn't give an excuse for being bloodthirsty. I would say it's an absence of the Lord's, his, his word in this land. That's what I would say. When Christians go into the church and they shut the doors, if they're only concerned about being around the righteous, then those who are in the dark have no deliverance. And that's what's happening. Because most people who know the Lord, they're only comfortable around those who know the Lord. They're, they're, they don't want to go out and do the work anymore. So they let the world prosecute each other, rip each other to shreds. That was happening in the days of Noah also. Kingdom was fighting against kingdom. They were consuming the acquisitions of men, right? They were teaching people war. That happened in the days of Noah. In fact, something was so bad. Now, we've had wars before, haven't we? We've had some pretty bad things in this world. But the Lord didn't destroy the entirety of the earth. So we know that in the time of Noah, it was something was extraordinarily evil in the lands. And when the Lord says he's likening these days to the days of Noah, again, there's something very evil in the lands, something that a lot of people are not used to. It is vicious, and everywhere you see the absence, of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the minds of people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not supposed to sit in a church and only play peekaboo on Sunday. The gospel of Jesus Christ is something that should be in the land itself. 
it should be thought about. You know, it was in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 40s, people thought about the gospel of Jesus Christ. On Sunday, people had reverence for the living God. I used to hear people back when I was young, they would say, I'm not doing that. And we're talking about bad people. Even the mafia didn't cross certain lines. That's not true now. It's not true. They're convinced that God is some sort of a construct, that Christ is just a historical figure, and people are living their lives according to data and science only. That's what they're living their lives in accordance with. It is very dark indeed, and they're prosecuting everybody and anybody they can. People are getting away with just about everything. Back during that time, there were some serious things going on. In Hollywood, with all the rich, all these famous people, they were doing some pretty dirty things. They can't just come clean 2023 like they never did it. They were doing some bad stuff, and people were willing to do bad things to get ahead. All those stories are coming out. They're going to be too numerous for anybody to deal with. And don't don't celebrate over somebody's victory because they won a case in court over somebody else because another court case they're going to lose. It's just the type of world that we live in. You sue someone. And a hundred people are going to sue you. You're going to raise an army of a thousand to sue them back. This world is being quickly based off of vengeful acts. But the media, and I'm saying this because the media is going away. Just in case you didn't know that, it's going to be gone. There, there'll be no media. In fact, television itself is going to change. I mentioned this, uh, it was the last month. All these, all the programming that you see on television, all that will change. It'll be an on-demand system, totally. Viewership will be down to 0% when you're dealing with Internet. That's why Internet companies or, or cable companies have moved to Internet. That's their number one product, not the programming. These kids that are about to turn 22, 23, 24, they do not watch television. They stream everything. They watch what they want to watch. You know what that means? That means that everybody can indulge. They can truly indulge in whatever they want to indulge in. They're going to get no opposing message to what they want. You know what that's going to do? It's going to cause an instant spoil type nature to everybody in this country. See, when you can watch what you want to watch, it's going to bolster what you have inside you. You're not going to know anybody else's point, way, or anything else. You're going to grow an appetite just for those things you want. Then you start demanding what you want, like kids do today. They demand what they want. And because no opposing messages, like, uh, 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 If somebody's watching TV and all of a sudden a minister pops on, they start giving a sermon, they're not going to have that. If they don't choose it, they won't see it. So when one person in America meets another person in America, they're going to be real strangers. They're not going to know each other at all. The only thing tying people together these days is that people still have to work together. That's it. As far as knowing a person because they affiliate with something neutral on television, that's going to be gone because everybody's going to be able to watch what they want to watch. And according to, this is from data, the average kid does not watch a movie completely all the way through. They don't do that. They watch seven or eight to ten movies simultaneously mixed in with videos and funny things. And for the most part, kids would rather watch somebody testing limits on the Internet through TikTok or something else. That's the environment that's being cultivated in America right now. So everybody is living in their own personal world. And you know what happens when people live in their own personal worlds? They want no one invading or changing it. They're going to have such demands that authority is going to be all but lost. They will demand how they expect things to be governed, which means governance is soon to be lost. I believe that's when it gets handed over to this one entity who will make it that way for everybody. They won't hold back technology. It's only people with morals holding back certain types of technology who put a big stamp of rejection on what the cable companies wanted to do last year. But no one's there to really oppose that now. So here we go. People will be isolated, cut off. Some will suffer and no one will know about it. Entire causes will be lost in the world. When crime rate goes up, kids are not concerned about the crime, are they? And unfortunately, you have a lot of children these days that do know Christ. And we're coming to the time in the Bible when society will be like it never has been. In other words, you're not going to have a bunch of children going out witnessing the people. People will have been witnessed too, but they will absolutely reject it. And they will accept something else. These are the days of the beast when they absolutely reject Christ Jesus in the open and they embrace whatever supports their lusts. When the world operates by lust again, this is where we are right now. And it's going to be everywhere. 
the media, they're just, they're messing themselves up. It's what they're doing. Media companies are trying to save money by letting people go who stir the waters, but they're going to find quickly that everybody stirs the water. They're not going to be able to hold on. NBC, ABC, all these master, all these uh, corporate companies who are used to running the broadcast system, they're losing money big time. Did you guys know that? Forget about this writer's protest. These companies are losing money. Unfortunately, when it all goes under and programming is changed, and we have companies like Microsoft and we have uh, Xfinity and all these subsidiaries, right? They're going to change how they program. It's going to be more like YouTube everywhere. I would say it's going to, I've seen part of the on-demand system. This run by, it, it almost, uh, in fact, they were talking about Elon Musk and his Neuralink project being incorporated into entertainment. So based on your desires, based on your habits and everything else, based on metrics, programming will be, you know, it, it'll just be fine-tuned to you. You'll have that interactive, you'll have your co-pilot, which is AI. Everybody's going to have a co-pilot. Every single person here, I hope you realize this, but you're about to have an assistant, not like Cortana, not like Siri, not like Alexa, but an assistant with using the new devices. You will not be able to use a new device without an assistant. And you know how they do cell phones, right? They're always encouraging, get the new, get this new cell phone, get this new cell phone. If you don't switch your cell phone service to some of the new, newer devices, you will not be on the phone. You won't have phone service at all. Somebody says, can you refuse? Of course, but you just won't have phone service. You won't have internet service. You won't have anything. You can refuse all day, but if you refuse, you will not be able to access the internet. Even right now, they, they're putting things in place for older, um, older IPV protocols will not work on the internet. They're not going to work. Even right now, some of these protocols are dead. Trust me, they're dead. You cannot use what, what you could use about, what, six years ago. You can't use that now. So if you don't have uh, some of the new technology, you will not be connected to the world. No, that means no telephone. Now, ask yourself this. How many people would honestly not have a telephone? Don't do it for posturing or anything, but just think about that. I'm going to tell you right now that not one of us would make it through the time of the beast without Christ. We would not. We would fold. I'm just telling you that right now. It's going to take the strength of Christ and the Holy Spirit to help us through. People can brag all day long. I, I just know better. How many of you have been starved to death? How many have not eaten anything? You've gone a period of time and you did not eat not one morsel of food for about 11 to 15 days. Anybody ever go through that? Let me explain this to you. Because if you don't have access to a phone, you'll not have access to a store. Your car won't be able to, your car's not going to go anywhere either. You'll be cut off at the limbs. And if you've not gone a long time without food, you go six days without food. Your whole concept of life is going to change. You go 11 to 15 days without food. Everything about you is going to change. You'd be surprised how your body craves. Unless you're one of those who have fasted. And you have found out in that fast how hard that fight is. It's hard to fight off the desires of the flesh. You'll only know the full strength of your desires. You'll only know that if you fast. So you guys know that? I mean a complete fast, not a partial fast. Not some, you know, fast that we think of, but a true fast where you deny the flesh everything. That's when you find out how cravings of the flesh can win over anything. And I'm telling you again, if the Lord does not strengthen us, we're not going to make it. But he already said he would, didn't he? He said, in your patience, possess ye your souls. So it's going to take faith. It's going to take you knowing without any feedback. That means people will reach a time where if they believe the Lord because they've got this good thing over here, this good thing over there, the real test is going to be where you love the Lord when you got no good thing anywhere. See, right now, I'll tell you right now, I will love the Lord regardless of what our gift is in my favor. I've been there too many times before. When everything was going wrong, I could still say thank you, Lord. My saying thank you, Lord, is not based on anything favorable that's happened to me. But can everybody see that? Because all of us are going to get to that point. We'll become those people we read about Revelation who overcame the dragon by the word of their testimony, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The word of my testimony is that Jesus is Lord. And I mean that with all of what I am. He is Lord. My life, my soul is not my life. And my life is not my soul. Just like I am not my flesh. So that means my life can absolutely fall apart. And it has nothing to do with the salvation of my soul. I've already made that distinction. But a lot of people think that Jesus is only real so long as they can be blessed. 
I'll tell you right now, many of you have gone through a period where it looks like you have not been blessed. And how did you think about the Lord then when you were not blessed? Because at time of the beast, the Bible is very clear that no one is going anywhere until there come a falling away first and that man of perdition be revealed. No one will go anywhere. That means all those who are waiting for the rapture, the rapture will not take place. The day of the Lord is not going to take place. That window will not open up until the revealing of that guy or that thing. Because a lot of people back then, they thought they missed it. And what did Paul say? What did Paul say? See, a lot of people in these times, they're trying. Listen, this is what shouldn't happen. How many have how many have been upset? If you can tolerate me for a moment, you'll never have to deal with being upset again. Because many of you have been upset, upset. And I mean spiritually upset. How many have been spiritually upset? A lot, right? Been spiritually upset, challenged in the spirit. You felt down and out. It felt like it's, it, it feels like it's taking forever for the Lord to do what he has to do. How many have asked recently, Lord, when are you coming back? Because I don't know how much longer I can take this. You, you can be honest here at COT. For those folks who have been upset, I mean, almost to the point of tears. There's a reason you've been upset. There's a reason you get tired of the the day-to-day -day mundane things. But you have to understand what getting tired is. Don't ever give yourself an excuse saying everybody gets tired. Don't ever repeat that to yourself. That's not true. It's almost like a person says, well, everybody makes mistakes. Don't say that either. You have a supernatural father who happens to be a supernatural creator who also put you here in supernatural conditions, who's keeping you supernaturally. So don't say Everybody's going to make mistakes because the Bible says Jesus is able to keep us from falling in the first place. And if we continue to do the same things over and over again, it's because we chose to do it. That means we're willing not to change. So let's go ahead and get those comments out of our minds. That's an excuse of flesh. That's almost like telling your flesh, okay, go ahead and do what you want to do because everybody does it anyway. No big penalty. Don't do that. Dare to hold yourself to a higher standard. Now, let's go ahead and face the truth. I just asked a few minutes ago how many people have gotten to the point where they said, Lord, was taking so long I can barely take another day. Do you know why? Do you know why that happened? I'm sure to think back to the moment when you did that. What happened? You looked around and you saw that things were not changing. Is that true or false? You looked around and that situation that should have changed. It did not. You have a persistent issue going on. Something is persistent. Something won't change. It's like something won't give in. You thought you'd be delivered by now, but you're not. You don't know how long you can take this situation. In fact, if you said it recently, you've said it before. And if you said it before and you just said that recently, you haven't been smiling that much. The true joy of the Lord, you have not experienced that much. Will that be correct and accurate? Is it, that be fair to say? And it all boils down. It all leads back to one thing. Now, I can tell you right now, there's a spirit that's going to hate what I'm about to say. And that spirit is not of your father. But if you want to get out of that frame of mind, you got to stop controlling scripture. Here's what I mean by controlling scripture. Somebody reads the scripture, you say, oh, no, 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 no. That means this. That's what that means. That means this. You give an instant rebuttal to everybody else because you're trying to believe something in a hopeful place like, like the rapture. If somebody came down from the heavens and said the rapture will certainly not take place until half the world's on fire, everybody would say, uh, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, that's not what the Bible says. That's what everybody would say. Because they have come to a conclusion where that word come from, or an A in some cases, has a pause in it. One of those Greek words. Isn't that a, isn't that a, um, I, I'm going to say calling away? That's a calling away, right? You mean call away. The uh, heart pause possibly being called away, right? So if that's the case, and we read in 2 Thessalonians, and it says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by the gathering together unto him, that ye not soon be shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. You don't think they knew about it? As that day, he said, so don't act like that day has come and gone and you've been, you've been, you're stuck here or somehow you did something wrong because he said, let no man deceive you by any means. Oh, see, he said that, but we let man deceive us. Yes, we did because people have set dates for the rapture and people believed it. Anybody who sets a date for a rapture is deceiving people. That's deception, especially when the Lord does not know when he's going to be sent. How in the world can a person know before the Lord does? Because if we start believing these dates, if we start believing these dates, we're going to get our hopes up. The Bible said hope deferred makes one sick, makes the heart sick. 
Your heart's been sick because your hope has been deferred because you hoped for something that was not true. When something is not true and you hope for it, you're going to get sick because it didn't happen. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. For that day shall not come. It, it what? It didn't say that day might not come. It didn't say that day, you know, you know, it's a possibility. No, it says that day shall not come, except there come a falling way first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, do all of us know who that who that man of sin is? No, we do not. We know that people are falling away left and right, but we don't know. We, we God is not given the entirety of the it's not gonna be one person who knows who this thing is. It's going to be all of us. When God reveals something to his children, he reveals it to everybody. He already told us where the guy comes from. I would go so far as to say most of the candidates that people have have been wrong. And that's the problem. Because when you're trying to be right, you can't be corrected. You remember when everybody thought Clinton was the beast? And people had knocked out. I mean, they had some fallouts over this. Then they thought the Iranian president was the man. Not good candidates. Not good. That's right, he comes from a small people, not a big people. He comes from a place with very little influence, not big influence. People are trying, when you're trying to be right, when you want your way to be established, that's where the heartbreak comes in. People get in relationships, right? Somebody says, well, I don't know about that guy. You know, that's a good spouse. That's a good girl. That's a good guy. On down the road, they're heartbroken because they kept saying this, defending their position, when in fact that wasn't the case. We have to start learning to live day by day by truth, all of us. You guys may be shocked at this. I'm not concerned who the beast is because the Lord's going to let me know when he lets you know who the person is. I'm not going to ever get into competition of who knows who who is first. Because when God said he would have that person revealed to all of us, and when something is spiritually revealed, then all of us will have that truth. It's written right here. And who this person is, let me tell you something. First of all, you don't want this person to come to the forefront because you may not be ready for it. See, while everybody's waiting to go home, they forgot to prepare. It's, it's almost like if somebody said, hey, I'm going to give you this million dollars after the marathon, okay? And you say, okay. 90 years goes by, and another generation gets that same message. You get a million dollars after the marathon. All of a sudden, everybody becomes an expert on when you're going to get the million dollars and they forgot about the marathon. Well, you have to train for a marathon. You're just not going to get up out of a chair and go run a marathon, will you? So in this case, it's almost like everybody's focused on the winnings and they have forgot that they have to train for a marathon. Nobody can get up from a chair and start running a marathon. You've got to train for a marathon. And the truth is, all that time that has been passing, people were supposed to be training for the marathon. But the money caught their attention. In this case, leaving Earth has caught people's attention. And they forgot they have to prepare for what's coming. So what is coming? People are going to fall away. That means your faith is going to be challenged. If not for Christ, you would fall away. That's not a good thing. That means things are going to become very trying. We're supposed to be training for this. That man of sin is going to be revealed, the son of perdition. We're supposed to be training for this because God's coming to get those who are not smiting their fellow servants, who are not overindulged in the world. He's coming to get those who are maintaining his ways. And if we fail during these two events we're supposed to be training for, he will not come and get us. See, everybody's waiting for Christ to come get them. And we we have nobody speaking about the training. Everybody's excited. Yes, I'm going to get an automatic pass to go straight to heaven. No, your faith is going to be tried first. The Lord, how explicit does the Lord have to be on this subject over and over again? Out of all the promises in the word of God, you're promised to have trials and tribulations. And he told us how important it is that we be tried. The Bible teaches us that anything committed to God is going to be tried by fire. And if it burns up, then it was not of him. Because if it does not burn, then it's truly of the Lord, which means all things are going to go through the fire. And we're not training for that, are we? We're sitting down in chairs saying, oh, the million dollars is coming up, but nobody is trained. Do you see? And then when the million dollars does not come, we act like we lost, like we can't take it anymore. Why? Because we have made up our own theology of when the Lord's coming, and we get upset when he does not come in the time frame that we want him to come in. We're throwing caution to the wind. We get ourselves in situations, right? We get weak, and we say, Lord, please come because I'm weak, and I've failed, and everything is falling apart. So in truth, when the training comes... We start saying, I don't want the training. I just want to leave. I don't want to do any of the hard stuff. I don't want to be tried. I just want to go and have a happy time. Those who were not burnt up 
Those are the ones who will be worthy to be in the kingdom of God. We're forgetting about that. Those who were tried, tried by darkness itself and did not fail, those are the ones who will enter into the kingdom of God. The ones who kept his word, not the ones who discarded his word. See, two things here, two important things here. A falling away, that day shall not come. It won't come, except there come a falling away first. We're already, I think that we see that right now. We see a lot of people who once had hope in the forgiveness of others. They don't have hope in the forgiveness of others. That's falling away. They don't believe, they don't walk like Jesus walked. Jesus walked to set the captive free. People walk these days to prosecute the captive. You know what they say when they see somebody captive? They say, I got you now. That's what happens when you choose the world over Jesus or when you're a bridge builder. A bridge builder is one that will take the ways of the world and make those ways holy like Christ is approving of them. Christ is not approving of what's happening in the world. Our Father in heaven sent his only begotten Son to die for the very ones people are pointing at and saying they're guilty. Of course they're guilty. We're all guilty. That's what the blood of the Lamb is for. For me to sit there and point at someone like their sin is worse than mine is to deny the blood for them. Do you see that? If you say someone is beyond redemption, you know what you're saying? The blood does not count for them. You're denying Christ on somebody else. Somebody said, do we train by reading in the word? No, you train by walking in the word. Not reading, walking. You, All of us can read, right? But we've got to walk the walk. It's a lifestyle. It should be natural. It can't be something that we emulate. It can't be something that we act like we're doing. Like when you go and meet your family, you say, oh boy, let me put on my family face. You guys know what I'm talking about. Or that worst person in your family comes in the door and you take a deep breath. All oh, that's fake. Because the truth is, you don't want that person around, do you? If you have to take a deep breath because you don't like that person who came in the door, then everything you're doing is fake because you're going to act like you like them. We're not talking about worldly training. We're talking about godly training. And you know what godly training is? It's when somebody walks in the door and you don't like them, you say, uh -uh, not in this vessel. I'm not to have that within me. Jesus came to set the captive free. That person is broken. If Satan's got them, they are in danger. And that's what the blood is for. Jesus said he didn't come to save the righteous. You remember that? So why is it now in 2023 that we think Jesus is only for those who are righteous? What in the world has happened? We train by aligning ourselves with Christ so that every single day we're not acting, but we're authentic. That's how we train. When you find yourself acting, that's when you turn around and say, oops, I got to go to the Lord. This thing is still in me. It's got to go. Because if something is in you, it can only be in you if you agree with it. It cannot be in you if you do not agree with it. And if something is in you, you're agreeing with something you shouldn't agree with. Do you all see that? The Bible says a man is drawn away and tempted of his own lust, which means it has to be in you first before you can be lured into doing something. You can't be tricked into doing anything. You can't be tempted into doing anything that is not within you first. You have got to agree with it to be tempted by it. Once it's no longer in you, you can no longer be tempted by it. You will no longer agree with it. You will not walk in that way. Now you're living different. You want that supernatural change. You want your issue, your situation to change in your life. You've got to be authentic, which means we got to stop being prideful by saying, oh, I'm, I'm okay in this area and that area. No, nope. we've got to go to the Messiah and say, Lord, show me because I don't know. And tell the Lord, you tell me that I'm right. I don't know if it's right. We got to stop saying, I know I'm right about this scripture. Stop saying that and say, the Lord is right about his own scriptures. We mess it up every single day. But the Lord is right. I'm just doing my best and I could be wrong. But see, if you can't say that, then you're full of pride. If you can't say that you could potentially be wrong, you're full of pride. Pride is the only thing that will cause a person to say, I know I'm not wrong. These are dangerous times. Now, think about what we're talking about right now and how many people are falling away and they don't even know it. How many people have given themselves over to acting, falling away from the truth and they don't even know it? How many? Lots. A whole bunch. A whole bunch. Why? Because they have listened to people that said, oh, don't worry about it. Everybody makes mistakes. Oh, don't worry about it. Everybody does dirt every so often. Oh, don't worry about it. And we're believing that. But let me tell you this. We're believing that by the flesh. Because even in your spirits, you don't agree with sin. Do you know that? You do not agree with sin. Your spirit does not agree with sin. Because if you have a born-again spirit... You're going to feel conviction of that sin, which means your spirit is crying out for truth. But in your flesh, it wants the easy way. 
Come on now, we all, all of us, we know this. Every single last one of us, we know this. We already know it. We live it every single day. We know exactly what we're doing, right? But here, here's the beauty of Christ. When somebody, it doesn't matter who the person is, when somebody in the body of Christ dares speak back to those points of sobriety, that's a blessing because it causes you to think, doesn't it? And then you say, oh, it's true. Let me get back on track. I'm sitting over here upset because I didn't have it my way. Uh-oh. Let me get back on track. I shouldn't be upset because the Lord has broke no promises. How can I be upset when the Lord didn't break any promise? So then I'm hoping for something prematurely based on what I want to take place, not exactly aligning myself with the truth. Because if all of us hoped for the truth, none of us would be heartbroken. It's when we hope for something not true, we're heartbroken, isn't it? Look at your relationship. In a relationship, you know what people really fall in love with? They don't even know who the other person is. What they fall in love with is who they want the other person to be. Listen to me. When two people get together, normally a person will create a vision with this other person in their minds. They fall in love with what they saw. And then when it doesn't turn out to be that vision they saw, they say, I made a mistake. This person is not who I thought they were. No, that person is not who you constructed in your mind, which means you never gave the person in front of you a chance. Now, many of you know this. You know why? Because you can't even be yourself around your own spouse. They don't see you, nor do they embrace you for who you are. You have to become somebody else to be embraced, don't you? You already know this. So when we know things like this, why would we sit there and fall for something we're so well versed in? See, everything God wants you to really know, you're living through and have lived through. We just have to learn to apply what we have lived through and stop saying things were a mistake. Oh, that was such a tragedy. Because if you do that, you're going to throw valuable learning away and you'll be blind. The Lord is pulling scales off of our eyes. We keep putting the scales back on. Well, the reason... We broke up with so-and-so and this and that. Like a male. A male blames the woman because something didn't go right. When is a male going to stand up and say, you know what? God gave me the authority to love my family and to love my wife as, as he loved the church. And I'm the one who allowed Satan in to have his way because I stopped standing for truth. It's all my fault. When will a guy take full responsibility? For the breakdown of the relationship, you don't hear that too much, do you? You always hear blame. One side will blame the other. When will the woman finally say, I should have been supportive and not try to have kingship over my other half? Because we know that's what happens. You challenge a woman and the woman gets mad because you challenge the woman. But see, this takes godly order. When a man knows who he's supposed to be, who God made them to be, because if you don't know who you're supposed to be, you're not reading the instruction manual. And when a woman knows who she's supposed to be, it has nothing to do with one bowing to the other. It has nothing to do with that. A woman's not going to come over there on her knees bowing to the husband. That's foolishness. That's not the way it works. A husband does not walk around with a staff commanding everything that happens in the house. That's foolishness. That's not what happens. The two become one flesh and both honor the other for who they are. What is a woman? A woman can hold the seed of a man. She has the ability to nourish the seed. That's what a woman is through and through. You think that just has to deal with children? You've made a mistake. If a man would bring in a godly seed, that woman can nurture that seed and nothing would be able to penetrate that relationship. But that's not what happens, is it? Why doesn't it happen? Because we don't even see the person in front of us. We see the person we had a vision about. We look at a person and say, wow, this could be great. That person, you know, this guy can go and find a job and we can make $1.2 million every two years. We're going to be living good and this, that, and the other. Everybody's trying to take control. If you take note of something, in a relationship, people are trying to make their own individual vision true over the other. That's what they want. That's all they want. They'll work toward that. And then when they find out, wait a minute, I thought this person would change by now. They're not at all who I thought they would be. No, the truth is, the truth is you never gave that person a chance. So people are not loving the person in front of them. They're loving the vision they have with that person. So they're starting out wrong in the first place. Look at the person before you. Expect nothing out of them. That's when you say, I love you. Look at your friends and your family. Expect no changes, no anything out of them. That's the person you love. That's where you start. You have to look at the whole person. God gave you that ability. Look at the whole person and then say, I love you right there. Don't love them for who they can be. Love them for who they are. Encourage them as best you can to do their, to be their best. But don't sit there and say, I love you if. If you look in America right now, isn't that what just about all relationships are based off? I love you if. 
And so what do you have? You have two slaves called husband and wife. One is trying to meet the expectations of the other. Your joy is not in the relationship. It now becomes a contract. In the body of Christ, the same thing. You know what we do in the body of Christ? Truth be told. Truth be told, the body of Christ was okay. I'm going to church, so now I got to be a Christian through and through. So you start acting, you pick up your posture a little bit, and now all of a sudden you're instantly holy. As soon as somebody says something, you say, Amen. Do you say that in normal life? Do you go out, you know, talk to people? And when they say something, you say, Amen. Do you do that? Nope, you don't do that. Amen means I agree with you, basically. I'm in agreement. So if you've noticed, I don't just say Amen to anything. Have you guys understand? I don't do that because I don't act like I'm in church when I'm in church. I can only be me. That's all. I'm, I'm not going to put on some cloak to present to everybody somebody I'm not. I can't do that. I can only be me. I'm no good at being anybody else. But a lot of people do that and they get, com- listen, they get comfortable doing this when they get around the people who believe in the Lord. They get comfortable becoming somebody else. And before you know it, they can't even see anything's wrong with it anymore. That's when you're in trouble. It's kind of like um, doing this small little sinful thing. Nobody knows you're doing it. The first the first months, you have conviction. You continue to do it, the conviction leaves. All of a sudden, in the third year, there's no conviction whatsoever to the point you're not aware that you're doing something sinful. You don't want Christ to come when you're doing something sinful and have accepted it wholeheartedly as being a part of your life. You don't want the Lord to come back when you're like that. All your troubles in your life, they're refining you to get rid of sin, period. Why is that message lost? You remember the older, older, older people? Anything you did, they would say, hey, get that right for yourselves. Don't continue in that sinful way. I mean, when you thought you had it together, they were speaking. You had instant conviction. You had conviction because they made you realize that what you were doing was not quite right. And so every time you faced them, you had something else to work on. I miss those times. What happened to those times? Because now you go up to a person, they treat you as an equal no matter what you're doing. That's sinful. When's the last time you heard about somebody talking about couples sleeping together? That is still adultery. You don't hear that, do you? Because it's a known fact that that word marriage is not really used in this day and age. People have partners, not marriages. But now you walk past, you, you know about it from people and there's no conviction, no anything. There's no spiritual recoil. There's no urgency to go tell this person or that person, listen, I mean, I'll still, I'll, I'll still do it, but I have to do it with the Holy Spirit. I don't go up to somebody and say, you know what you're doing is wrong because the Bible says people know what they're doing is wrong. They just need someone full of light to bring on that conviction again. They already know what they're doing is wrong. Conviction comes when a person of light is nearby. You don't even have to speak to them. But if you carry the light of the Lord, they feel convicted. Already conviction works again. Conviction does not work when everybody is doing things in the darkness. Conviction works when somebody of light shows up. You don't have to tell them anything because they'll look at you and say, Oh, I guess you're going to say that me and my girlfriend, that's sinful. That happened to me this morning. I didn't say anything. I just kind of walked in. Oh. Well, I guess, you know, I'm living in adultery because that's conviction. You know, it, you guys carry the same thing if you agree with Christ. If you're actually, if you actually show up, you're there. You carry the same thing. People only say things like that because you make them aware of the darkness in them. When Jesus showed up on the scene, what did he say? Men did not like the light. They didn't like the light that showed up with Christ. Why? Because they liked the darkness. That's what he said. Have you guys ever read the Gospel of John? It's pretty powerful. After he said there in the Gospel of John. And it gives such definition to that word darkness. It really does. Such definition. But when basically when he showed up, because he was full of light, it made everybody see the darkness. And men, he said, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So they didn't want anything to do with Christ. That's why they kept saying, crucify him, get him out of here. Because it may, because every time Christ came around, they remembered all the darkness within themselves. Just like we used to do when we were teenagers and a minister was around. You didn't even have to know. Listen, one time I had my back turned to a minister. I felt the minister. You know what I did? I stopped. Me and my cousin were talking about something. We stopped talking. Both of us turned around quick. I didn't, I didn't know he was there. My cousin didn't know he was there. We could feel it. You could feel it. And we both turned around. I saw one of my older cousins. He put a cigarette in his pocket. And it was still lit. And he was holding his breath, trying not to speak. Well, that was so funny. But that's what happens. Conviction. There's no conviction without the light. If there's no light, there's no conviction. What do you think those people in, in, in um, Revelation, they, they hated the two witnesses because the two witnesses brought much conviction. That's why. 
It made them aware of the darkness within them. You ever walk up to a person and not say a word? The person knows you love the Lord and they say, well, you can't judge me either. You ever have that happen? It'll happen with strangers. It'll happen with people you know when you carry that light. Carrying that light is not you being perfectly holy either. Carrying that light is when you agree wholeheartedly with Christ. My question to you is, do you still agree wholeheartedly with Christ? It's a waste of time for me to do something for me. It really is. It's just a waste. It goes nowhere. It's a waste. So I normally devote all of me to somebody else, and that comes through a breaking. You know, this is a process the Lord will sing you through. Once you're broken in a certain way, you'll see the importance of everybody else's life. So prayer is something that the Lord will open up to you. By faith, you can initialize that. By talking to your Lord about most things. You know how you get on the phone, you call somebody. Hey, what do you think I should do about so-and-so? Right? Then why don't you pray? Ask the Lord. Seek guidance from him. Now, when you seek guidance from the Lord, that doesn't, it means you don't go to everybody else. You seek it from the Lord and let him guide you. And believe it or not, he will send you people who will give you answers to those things they didn't even know you asked. And that's how you know it's from the Lord. When you do that from your inner voice, prosuke, that, that this Greek word, pros towards, and ekome, I like ekome, to vow or to wish, when you do that from your inner voice, no one knows about it but you and the Lord. Because that in the Greek, that inner voice was expressly no vocal communication. Do you guys have that? That's why it was called inner voice. Because an inner voice, you don't speak with your mouth. An inner voice, you speak internally. And that word that kept being used over and over in the New Testament talked about speaking from your inner voice, that inner voice. So it really confirms something, too, that you don't have to have a throat to pray to the living God. The sound that we make to each other, we do that for each other. You cannot read my soul. You can't read the desires of my heart. The Lord can. It's my entire point. And believe it or not, you're in communication with something on a continuous basis. The question is, what are you in communication with? Exactly what are you in communication with? And you'd be surprised once you become aware of that area of your life. You would be surprised that you talk a lot. Even when you don't talk, you do talk a lot. A lot of people will do this. Now, I'm going to just mention this because we're talking about sobriety and everything else. A lot of people will sit back and they'll watch something and say, in their hearts, they'll say, well, that person, well, they need to do something about that person. Who are you talking to when you say that? See, the Lord, will, he, he desires that people come to repentance. So who would you be talking to when you say that person needs to pay for what they did? Who would accommodate that message? You'd be surprised what you invite into your life with your inner voice. Now that you're aware of it, because see, you would never tell the Lord that person needs to pay for what they're doing because that would be almost blasphemous in his face. He has perfect judgment. So why would we remind the Lord that he needs to do something about that person when we know that all of this is about redemption when we know that we're not perfected when we know that if the lord came back this very second there's something we left undone and we would not go into the kingdom of god see how that works when you become aware of what you're doing internally i'm telling you things externally you're going to change when you start booting out cleaning out all these things within yourselves right you clean the inside out God will clean the outside. Everything on the outside is going to change. I'm just telling you now, if you have decay on the outside, then you have more decay on the inside, period. Get rid of that decay, and the body will follow. The body will always follow who you really are. Do you know that? Who you really are, the body must conform to. But you've got to be, it's time for all of us to be a bit more responsible with what we're doing with our hearts just because everybody else can't hear it, just because it's something that we're conceiving internally does not mean it's silent. No, we're talking to something, but what are we talking to on a continuous basis? If you're sitting up and you have a bad day and you're thinking about the, the how everybody should pay for what they're doing and this person should fail, who are you talking to? Who are you in alignment with? Who are you calling unto yourselves? Because when you send something out like that, who do you think is going to agree with that? It's not the living God. Are you going to call to yourself forces and things you don't want in your life? Is that how it works? Remember that, right? In the Bible, it says, you know how it says in the Bible that uh, life and death is in the tongue? Let me tell you something. That's your life and your death. You cannot speak death into my situation. Nobody can. They cannot because I don't agree with it. Nobody can speak death into my situation except the living God. You can't do it. Nobody else out there can do it. But I can speak death into my own situation. Because if I ever desire the death of your situation, I just spoke death upon mine. Do you see how that works? 
If I speak life into your situation, I just spoke life into mine. See how that works? That's one of the Lord's principles. That's in the Old Testament. It carries on to the New Testament. That's sowing and reaping. You know what the Lord said? Judge not that you be not judged for whatever measure you judge somebody with, you're going to be judged. When you're sitting around hoping that somebody pays for something, you're the one that's going to pay for it. I know a lot of people right now, they're saying, I don't have a heart like most people. They say, yeah, I hope Trump pays for this one. But see, here's what normally happens. They have a heart to have Trump pay for something. But by what are they motivated by? Probably political. You know what's going to happen? God will have their secrets revealed. And it's happening over and over and people can't understand what's taking place. They hope that the dirt of another is enough that they be prosecuted on. God will just simply have their dirt be known. Everybody has dirt. So when you hope that somebody's dirt is going to make them fall, then you, that person, whoever hopes that, is going to, he's going to fall by his own dirt. God didn't make your secrets known yet. Please understand that. If you have one of those prosecuting hearts, you're the big bad judge, and you think people should pay for stuff, just remember God did not disclose all of your dirt to everybody else. But he will to give you a mind in truth. God works in truth. And so when he works in you with truth, he's going to have you in that truthful position. And when you fall by the dirt you hoped upon another, when you fall by it, then you'll understand that mercy was needed, not somebody to prosecute that we've all fallen short of the glory of god if you continue to harbor hatred in your heart against somebody for what they did even against you and god has given you ample time to get that right to forgive that person to understand that it was the spirit or something got hold of that person's mind that they agreed with and that people with light didn't exactly show up to have that broken if you still don't understand then god said he will put you in that person's position God help the soul that goes through that. God does not have to put me in anybody's position to have an understanding. We have an ability we cannot deny. We can put ourselves in other people's shoes. All of us can do that. We ought to do that more to have an understanding. You want favor and mercy in your life? Then be full of favor and mercy for everybody else. I'll tell you right now, my life is run from favor and mercy. There's not been one person that can ever once say, I did not extend to them great mercy and favor. Understand what the true war is. Satan desires that the souls of men be condemned. So if he gets hold of them, what's he going to do? He's going to do everything, especially when he does it inside of all. He'll do anything to have that person condemned by all other human beings. Dare to be different. Continue the work of Christ. You know what people said when Jesus walked into that bar full of people who were committing adultery and doing everything else? They called him every name in the book that did not stop him from going. Did it. That's where I get my Jimmy Crack corn from. Right? You read that in the Bible where he went into the place where they were drinking and all this stuff, you'll fall out your chair. Like, what was he doing there? Because he was real. Because he was true. Because he was on a mission. Because he has a heart's desire that people be free. In order that people be free, you have to go where the broken are. And he went where the broken were. He suffered the broken. There was a person who was, there was a woman who was unclean by virtue of what she was doing. But the Lord never accused her once. How beautiful. Let me tell you guys something. There are things that people look at that are just rotten. People don't understand that when they join with another person, they take on the characteristics of that individual by way of their own spirits. So a person ends up with multiple, multiple personalities. Everybody they've been with, they have to deal with. That means instead of seeing one person, you understand that you're dealing with hundreds of people. And those people are fractured in their minds and severely tainted. That's what a person will see if they were pure flesh. The Lord seeks to set people free of that. Because nobody wants to be broken. Do you hear me? Nobody wants to be tainted. Nobody wants that stuff in their lives. And Jesus came that a person could be free of those things. So whatever disgusts most people, I'm willing to go. What about you? I'm willing to be talked about. What about you? There have been so many people in my life, they say, you shouldn't talk to that person. It's going to ruin your reputation. Give me crack corn. I don't care. But when the Lord sends me, so I don't care how people look at me. I'm not doing what I'm doing for the sake of promotion. I'm trying to do what I do for real. So people are actually helped. So they find Christ. Because once they find the physician, that's when surgery can begin. That's the only time I'll know they'll be okay. They can find me all day. That doesn't mean they're going to be okay. When they find the great physician, they're in good hands. And so long as I have the wherewithal to show people where the great physician is, that's what I'm going to do. I don't care where I have to go to, to do that. I'm going to do it. That's a mind. All of us can be more authentic than what we are. Because what if the Lord, what if right now everything we thought, everything we refused to change, God had that stick on us. You know how people say, well, Obama's the Antichrist or Trump's the Antichrist. This person, what if he didn't allow us to ever withdraw that? 
We'd never step foot into the kingdom when all of them fail, would we? Also remember something else, everybody. When you're in America, you're going to interpret Revelation by American happenings. When you're in Europe, you're going to interpret Revelation by European happenings. When you're in the Middle East, you're going to interpret Revelation by, by Middle Eastern happenings. Don't do that. Let God be right. If men want to guess, let them guess, but let God be right. What I mean by that, let the Lord do exactly what he said he would do in his word. That this person of perdition would be revealed to you because you do not want to blame a person or point at a person or accuse a person of anything that is not right. You don't want to do that because that's against the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's against why Jesus came to this world. You do not want to falsely accuse someone of being something they're not. And only God knows what they absolutely are. It's a bit prideful of us and boastful of us to continue to point at people who are appointed president. I'm sure they thought King Nebuchadnezzar was the guy. I'm sure they thought Nero was the guy. If somebody were to say Clinton was the Antichrist, but Clinton dies and he's not the Antichrist, it's not like that person who said that is going to repent. They won't. You know why? The world excuses that, but your Father in Heaven will not. I hope you know that. And every time we say somebody's the Antichrist, you know, we're also saying that that person is condemned, that that person is Satan incarnate. That's what we're saying. We're saying that Jesus did not die for them. That's what we're also saying. And God help you if you're wrong. God help you if you're wrong. These are the very things in the end days that the Lord said would happen and that we must refrain from. And all it takes, listen, this is all it takes, is for us to turn back to Christ and truly listen to him, not to ourselves. Not to everybody else, but to listen to the Lord. Because if we listen to the Lord, what does he tell us all the time? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your enemy. If you cannot do that, then you cannot keep the commandments of Christ. If you cannot keep those commandments, then the Father and Christ will not make their abode with you. If you can love your enemy, you will not accuse him. You will seek for his deliverance. You will seek the Lord. You will seek guidance. You will labor for his or her deliverance. That's what happens when you listen to the Most High. You will end up giving everybody an opportunity. Has anybody ever wondered why the thousand year reign comes? And then all of a sudden Satan is loosed after that thousand years to deceive people again? Have you ever wondered why that must happen that way? I have a belief in that regard. It's just a belief. I believe that God is so merciful. I really do believe he's so merciful that a lot of people, one of their primary excuses is, I, I, I just couldn't see it. And I didn't have enough evidence, and that's why. So guess what he does? He gives all those people direct evidence of angels, of Christ, of everything else. And even after seeing all of that, they were still deceived. They will have no excuse. I just think that's a merciful act from him. He didn't have to have a thousand-year reign. He didn't have to have a time of peace where Satan is bound. But when Satan is bound, everybody's going to behold supernatural things. There are going to be human beings here. Human beings are going to be on this earth. And those human beings, when they give themselves over to Satan again to fight the living God, right, that they have seen, that they have experienced, there'll be no excuse for them. That's why I know that no one is going to go to hell because they really honestly and truthfully didn't know something. God doesn't work that way. That's how man thinks because man is crooked at his root. God doesn't do work that way. A person cannot be absolutely condemned unless they absolutely have made a truthful choice. In order to make a choice, you have to see clearly what you're making a choice of. That's why things have to be presented to everybody. Everybody will have their moment of clarity. Somebody says, yes, also, Micah, feel to prove Satan will never repent. Well, no one even has to prove that they were made eternal. Because angels and Satan is made eternal, the mindset of an angel is different than ours in this way. We have what you would call a influenced mindset. But imagine someone who's born and knows the entirety of the truth. Now we're talking about a person who's made eternal. You cannot be made with this temporary stuff that we have now. If you're made eternal, you're going to exist differently. There are certain things you won't be, you won't be exposed to. You will know things for a fact. Now, if, if a person knows something for a fact, that means they have seen it, they have lived with it, they operate by it, they know how things work, and then they say no, they have truly said no. Satan is not going to be given an opportunity to repent, because when he said, when he said no, 
he really said no. And let me give you a further example of that. If any of you were to say, I hate Mike from around the world, I can forgive you easily. Do you know why? Because you don't really know me. That's why. But if you lived with me 200 years, if you knew all of my habits and quirks and everything else, if you knew my kindness and my not so kindness, and then you said you hate me, then guess what? Then you really hate me because you know me. If you know me by faith, which is to have no proof of anything I do, you just, you know, we communicate from time to time, then you know me by faith. You don't really know me, and I can forgive you easily. You can be forgiven of blasphemy against everything but the Holy Ghost. Why? In order to blaspheme the Holy Ghost, you have to experience what the Word said you have to experience. And the Word gives an explanation as to why a person cannot be forgiven against blaspheming the Holy Spirit. To blaspheme the Holy Spirit is to, let's just say, is to disrespect it, to cast it down to the ground. Well, guess what? If you experienced the powers of the world to come, the very throne of God, we're talking about experience, not by dream, not by faith. No, we're talking about having be, becoming one with God's glory, with God's power, with God's authority, becoming one with it. When you become one with that, then you know that, you know that, you know that God's spirit, you know exactly what it is. If you disrespect it or cast it down to the ground at that point, you cannot be forgiven because you have truly cast it down to the ground. Those who blaspheme the Holy Spirit are those who partook of it. The Holy Spirit falls on everybody. It does not mean you're partakers of the Holy Spirit. To be a partaker of the powers of the Holy Spirit means you operate by it. That means you're someone different. That means for you in your life, you now are an experiencer of God's throne. You don't have faith in it. You don't have faith in Christ. You know Christ. You don't have faith in God. You know the living God. And you have experienced his glory. Now that's in the New Testament. That's in the word. You ought to read that again. That's in there. And that's why they can't be forgiven. Because they cannot crucify Christ again. They can't even bring themselves to do that. And it does not say that God kills them. It says they give up the ghost. You're not going to be walking around guessing and hoping. Every word in your mouth is going to have authority. You'll know the do's and don'ts. You're not going to slip or do all these. That's not what you're going to do. Should you ever blaspheme something you know you become one with, you have truly cast it down to the ground. For those of you who, you can be guided by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can speak to you, but you don't know you're not become one with the Holy Spirit. Then guess what? How can you blaspheme it? How can you cast something down to the ground you never knew in the first place? You can't do it. You have to become one with it. And that's how people blaspheme the Holy Spirit, is having become one with it. And in every single case, they gave up the ghost as soon as they cast it down to the ground. So they don't stick around long, they're gone. Bye-bye. Can you imagine conviction so great that you give up the Spirit? God did not strike them down, they gave up the ghost. Just imagine that. What could be so heartbreaking that you would give up the ghost? See, right now, you could give up the ghost, but you don't. Because there's nothing so heavy upon you that you would just give up the ghost. Blaspheming the Holy Spirit, you would give up the ghost. And that's in there too. Because you wouldn't be able to bring yourself to crucify Christ again. To forgive you of those sins. The burden would be too heavy, the realization too real. Listen, in the word God, Jesus is clear. That authority, you remember when Jesus said, you'll receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You know what that means? The laying on of hands and people recover. It doesn't mean you sit there and pray for somebody for five years and they might recover. That's not what that means. That means you're operating by kingdom authority. That means any decay is undone right there, Johnny, on the spot. Kids recover, people recover, things happen in your presence. That's what it means. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. Now, it says that the Holy Spirit, to operate like that, to receive that power, is reserved for those who obey the Lord. Those who obey the Lord. To obey the Lord is to never argue about Scripture. To obey the Lord is not to do the little side thing. It's not to be judgmental. It's not to be any of those things. So you have a lot of people who, by way of the Holy Spirit, Christ is with them because he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I will pray through the Father, and he will sing you the Holy Spirit in my name, and I will be with you. And that's how that works. So by way of the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ is with us. But the power of the Holy Ghost is reserved for those who obey the Lord, not for those who don't. Because if you were ever to receive the power of the Holy Spirit and disobey the living God, you would not be alive another day. You'd be gone. That's blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God poured out on all flesh. It is described in Acts chapter 2. It refers back to the prophecy of Joel. It tells you all of it. 
how that the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh, not some flesh, all flesh. But it also tells you about the power of the Holy Ghost. That's also told about in in 17 other parts of the Old Testament. It really breaks that down. It is very specific. So all of you have the Spirit. Not everybody will operate or have the power of the Holy Ghost. They will not have that. Because if a person has the power of the Holy Spirit, that takes one who is ready to lose everything to obey. That's what it takes. It doesn't mean you're missing anything. That's not what it means. That's not what it means. But I can tell you right now, many are appointed to have that. God doesn't do what he does for show. God's not in show business. Right? We read in the Bible that most of these miracles and everything else are going to be done by very dark people, don't we? So those people who are healing people in streets and in the open and marketing the healings and everything, come here, pay $50 to this conference and get healed and all this stuff. That's going to be done by those who claim to be with Christ but are not with Christ. That's why the Antichrist is doing all these uh, uh, lying signs and wonders at the end. The Lord does them right now, but guess what? He does not advertise it through those vessels. People are being healed all the time. There are people walking around with the power of the Holy Ghost, but it's not advertised. God does what he does for real, not for sure.